Club takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Pam Warren, and I am an executive member of the Canadian Club of Toronto. With the Tokyo Games just over two months away, we know Team Canada is hard at work. In the face of unique challenges posed by the COVID pandemic, the team has adapted and thrived. Today, we're joined by David Shoemaker and Marnie McBean as they discuss the resilience of Team Canada as they strive for victory at the Summer Games, the power of sport to inspire change, and how they're deploying values-based leadership for success. Before we hear from our speakers, here's some information about how to participate with us. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window, and they're going to be sent over to Marnie, who's going to moderate the discussion. The request help button located at the bottom right corner of the page is for technical support. Thank you to today's event sponsor, Morneau Chappelle. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people for 124 years. And it's because of our sponsors that we can continue to do that. So thank you, Morneau Chappelle. Now to introduce today's speakers, I'm very proud to present David Shoemaker. David is CEO and Secretary General of the Canadian Olympic Committee. With over 20 years of experience in the sports industry, David Shoemaker is an accomplished global sports executive. Before joining the COC, David spent seven years as CEO of NBA China and seven years at the Women's Tennis Association. Joining David in conversation today will be Marnie McBean. Marnie is one of Canada's most decorated Olympians. She is one of only two Canadians to ever win three gold medals in the Summer Olympics and is serving as chef de mission for Canada's Tokyo 2020 Olympic team. And I understand has been a friend of the Canadian club since the 90s, so thanks, Marnie. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is the toast that we make to our country. So if you have a drink nearby, join me in a toast to Canada. 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 And Marnie, I'll turn the club, Canadian club podium over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Pam. Um, we're pretty excited about this. And, uh, you know, one of the things about Chef is I often uh, get to go first. But today, I'm, I'm deferring to David. I'm going to let David open this up and uh, el, to our El Presidente and Secretary General. <laughs> thank you, Marnie, and, and thank you, Pam, and thank you for having us. We are 71 days from Tokyo, uh, and notably 267 days from the Winter Games in Beijing as well, um, in this ever-challenging uh, double Olympic year. Um, and so uh, there's lots to talk about as, as we sort of enter the home stretch on our way to Tokyo. And uh, I'm joined by an icon. Um, you gave a little bit of scratch the surface of the introduction for Marnie McBean, um, but she's somebody that I assume is no stranger to most of the audience, a household name, um, and somebody that I certainly cheered for in Barcelona and Atlanta and watched her uh, and her 
uh, partner or, or, uh, or, or friend and partner uh, go on to amazing things um, on behalf of this country. So it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, it's sort of one of those pinch me moments that I dreamt of when I took on this role to sort of be joined by Marnie to be here with the Canadian Club. So the, the thing that Marnie is now is this, this notion of chef de mission for us at uh, for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. And and I guess the first thing I'm curious about, Marnie, is how do you say it, right? Because some people try to make it sound fancy and other people say it in English. What's what's your, is, do you ratatouille, chef de mission? How do you say it? Oh, I like to say it. My, my five-year-old daughter is chef de mission. But uh, no, it's uh, chef de mission. And, um, you know, it's when I got the gig, it was... It was supposed to be this sweet little gig, right? Who, who, what, well, how big can a chef de mission be? And, and Tokyo was going to be these really easy games. Like when, when Tokyo got the games, it was the IOC was giving them into what they referred to as into a safe pair of hands, right? They'd had such chaos between whether it was Russia or Brazil or South Korea, you know, Japan, this was going to be the easy games. So I was joking that I was the sushi chef. And uh, now Chef de Michon has come with uh, so much more uh, packaged into it. And I think, you know, I, I, I haven't had a conversation in the last 15 months without describing what the Chef de Michon is. Um, so uh, for everyone in the audience, I'm, I'm officially the head of delegation for Team Canada. Uh, but I'm really lucky that the Canadian Olympic uh, Committee um, and the Canadian Olympic team, they're way more professional than, than just recruiting somebody in for 18 months slash 30 months um, to be head of the delegation. And, and the Canadian Olympic team has professionals who've been working on the logistics and the administration, gosh, everything from cargo to outfitting. Um, you can imagine taking a, a delegation of uh, beyond the athletes, which will have about 400 um, athletes, we'll have about 750 people um, in total uh, that, the logistics there are massive. Um, so I, I get to get, sit back a little bit. I used to say I was a, a bit like the queen, you know, not the prime minister, you're the prime minister. Um, and, and I'm the queen. Uh, I get to be the spokesperson, the ambassador, you know, the, the mentor, the mascot, uh, whatever, whatever the team seems to need. I was with you. Uh, it was Canada day back in 2019 uh, where we had the, the great privilege to announce you to, to the country as our chef de mission for the Tokyo Games in a big, huge crowd, uh, oh. high-fiving, shaking hands. Everyone was close. Hugs. So, just, yeah, hugs. Describe to a, uh, the audience then a little bit like how what you expected the role would be then, uh, how, how it's changed over the course of what is you know, now nearly two years. Yeah, well, I, I had anticipated. So one of the things you want for everybody on, on part of an Olympic team is for no new faces at the games. So part of what I, I thought I would be doing was having this really fun uh, opportunity through the fall, the winter, and the, the spring of traveling around um, North America, really, to go and, and connect with our, our team and with our athletes, to go and see them in their training environments, to... Um, to, to, to get it to get a kind of a feel of their sport culture and uh the, clearly that hasn't happened um you know i was supposed to have a couple of trips to tokyo and back in february of 2020 um that was for me when the the pandemic first came in and and you and the other senior senior leaders at the coc were like well we don't really need to be sending too many people to tokyo um because there's this thing going on we don't really know what it is so for me, it was a lot less travel and a lot less in-person visits to our, our, our team and to our athletes. And, and so the way I was building myself as a, a friendly and familiar face to the team, uh, that disappeared. And I would have to say that a lot of times um, I anticipated as a chef that it was just a nice to have, really. The, the fact that the chef would come and when I was an athlete as a rower... I, know, I didn't see the chef. Um, I didn't really need to see the chef until I was at games. So it was really going to be a nice to have. Um, and in February, when we did start rolling things back and we were starting to hear about the coronavirus and then it was referred to as a pandemic, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about the decision we made uh, in March of last year um, it, later on in the conversation but uh, one of the ways I'd always wanted to reach out to the athletes was through emails. And 
that really became important. So that was one of the big things that changed changed for me was uh, suddenly my my interactions with the team weren't going to be in person. They needed to be virtual. And the conversations uh, we were having with the athletes weren't about this like fun, ambitious management to the podium. It was more uh, life management. Um, really, I'm so proud of our team. I, I never had to work the conversation like to say it's important for them to stay home. But we needed to make sure that they knew it was important to be part of Team Canada. And and first important, important part of the bigger Team Canada, like the 37 million of us. Um, and we didn't, I, th- I think one of the things that have um, has been really important to me about this role is using the voice and the platform of the messages I've been sending out to not only the athletes, but um, our, our mission team, our business team. And like I said, all the administrators and stuff like that who are getting the team there. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with these these Zoom conversations is we're not gathering in rooms. And so I think there's been a way to uh, include our, our Canadian team members as, as part of Team Canada to be um, a thread of hope in a lot of times. Like these games are happening. Don't worry. Stay focused. You know, you, we're going to get there. We're all in this together. So I, I think I've, I've somehow come from a, a mentor mascot to a, sort of a thread of hope and positivity and, and realism. I've been able to send out information regarding the 20, the playbook, uh, the Tokyo 2020 playbooks, which I think we'll also talk about more. Um, and and I've, I've kind of enjoyed that aspect of it. You know, I've had real take home value uh, from the messages that you've been sending to athletes. And the one in particular that continues to stick out for me is your notion that there is no straight path to Olympic gold. And I've applied that to business sort of so that these bumps in the road, in some cases, huge potholes are things that we, we need to assume are going to happen, that they've happened. They're going to continue to happen on, on this journey to, to Tokyo. What, how, how have you drawn from sport to coach the athletes of today? And, and maybe what are, you know, what are some of the most, uh, sort of indelible experiences for you from when you were a competitor that you've used to sort of impart that wisdom? Well, well, you know, part of me wants to jump to, uh, you know, I, I often like to talk about how I learned um, that fear and doubt are part of every path, right? The presence of fear and doubt doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. It, it usually means you're on the right path and you care about it. But I'm going to jump to a conversation I had today, like just two hours ago, I was talking with our, our softball team. So today we just officially nominated uh, the 15 players and the coaches who will be our softball team. So there's Olympic things happening every day as much as things are locked down and shut down. But one of the things I learned from our softball team was that the first time I, I did go into their environment. So I didn't get to go there this year, but in 2007, I visited our softball team um, while I was mentoring them to the the Beijing Olympic Games. And in that environment, they talked a lot about failure. Like I came into this training camp and all they're doing is talking about failure, failure, embrace your failure, take in your failure. And I was like, guys, you want to, you want to get an Olympic medal. Like, why are you talking about failure all the time? And their sport culture, failure is really important. Like there's so many, you make so many mistakes in baseball and softball. They, they keep stats on it, right? They keep stats on your errors. And then, so they explained to me that they really believe that the way to move through and move forward is to um, accept and embrace your failures. And then you, that helps you move through and go on forward. And so today we were talking about that in the context, not of, of failure, but of change. And so that sport conversation has not only come into every sport that I've talked to, you know, we've got like 39 different summer sports and I think there's 16 different, 19 different winter sports. And I've taken that concept from one sport into everything and into my life and into pandemic um, planning that we need to accept these changes and, and more than accept them, we need to anticipate them. And the more that we're just like, Hmm, that was that, that was the moment what's next. Um, I think that's, that's the way, and that's the sort of messaging I'm, I'm taking forward. And, and it's, you know, the whole point of, of mentoring and, and going around it's, it's part of an oral history, isn't it? Like, Mentoring is really how we share our oral history and, and we the share the, the how we go through ambition management and and how, how we recognize like that that oral history is about, like you're saying, the, the path that is never straight. There is you come in and you listen to anyone, any champion. They're never gonna go, well, I I started here and I did a straight line over to here and it was great. Like 
that's not even a good story, right? There's always a hook, right? So I think it's been, um, it, it, it's been kind of crazy going through this and I've really enjoyed sort of applying what I've, I've learned, um, through, through everything. But, you know, I, I'm going to go over, over to you with the same thing. Like we have these incredibly diverse careers and backgrounds. Yours was WTA and uh, the NBA in China, but, um, you, you've gone all around the world, not done all these different things. Like what drove you to bring it all back and apply it to Olympic sport in Canada? Well, um, <laughs> it, it is a dream come true for me. I mean, that's at the end of the day, um, what, what drove me to do it. I, notwithstanding the incredible challenges that we seem to be facing on a daily basis, whether it's how do we, how do we get around, not to get around, how do we contend with quarantines for athletes who are coming back into the country or whatever the issue of the day might be? Um, I still consider myself really fortunate to be working on behalf of Team Canada. Um, but it goes back to my childhood. Uh, it, it goes back. I, I'm, um, my mother was a professional tennis player, as was my grandfather. Um, I, I grew up in one of those families that, you know, hung a Canadian flag that paid attention to how Canadians did in every single sport. You know, the little little maple leaf that the Canadian sports broadcasters put next to athletes names just so you know how they did. And that's for us, that's for our family. And, um, and I've, I've talked a lot about, you know, my winter experience, uh, winter Olympic experience with Steve Podborski at Lake Placid, but it was true in, in 1984 in, in Los Angeles too. And I remember still to this day, you know, watching the road race cycling, um, Steve Bauer, uh, and Alexi Graywall of the United States. And we won silver, unfortunately. But for me, just sort of this notion that, that two athletes would, would compete so hard uh, for their countries, it's just stuck with me my whole life. And so I had the good fortune of, of working in sport, working in tennis, working in basketball. And uh, when my family and I decided to come back to Canada, um, this felt like you know, a, a literal homecoming, being able to come back and live in Canada, but also a sort of professional homecoming too, that I could sort of be part of something that I said, I felt my whole life cheering for. And now I get to be part of sort of building up and, uh, and maybe contributing to one of those podium performances. That's, that's pretty cool. It's the gear too, right? You, you just really wanted the jean jacket. You wanted to come in and, and and wear wear the team Canada jean jacket. I don't know what the uh, tennis players wore or the basketball. Play. It's the gear, right? It's the team Canada. It, like I, I'll tell you, the first time that so we had the Pan Am Games last summer in Lima, Peru, and the day that the kit, as we call it, the gear showed up in a suitcase at my home, and I opened it. It felt like Christmas. It kind of did, and I just looked at it all and everything. You know, the t-shirts and the shorts and the hoodies and the sweatpants and the yes you have your favorite items and you perhaps have your not so favorite items um but yeah you'd be surprised that uh, for all of us there's some little element of you feel pretty cool you know with the maple leaf and, and the, the word canada on your clothing and that it, and that you actually uh, were given it because of what you do um the the denim jacket uh it, it kind of came at a good time for us. Like, not that we're courting controversy, but um, you know, it 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 we'd launched our our kit for Tokyo for 2020 some time ago, and it got almost no attention. I'm sure you know that. And and then the U.S. just recently launched their kit, and and I guess it led to the side by side comparisons. And uh, you know, there some some of it's a little harsh, but at the end of the day, we we said our team looked at it as, hey, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And for our, for our partner at the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, it led to a lot of denim jacket sales, and so we're we're pretty happy about that. <laughs> well, I got I got to tell you, I've got that jacket, and I worn it. I have not worn it without somebody commenting on it that it's a great jacket. So it's it's kind yeah. of like there you Here go, it is. <laughs> right? 
I thought of wearing it today and I thought, no, no, Marnie's going to dress up for this. And so I better at least put on a, a nice blazer or something. At, but you know, at the, maybe at the I Canadian club, you got to wear a jacket, right? So I, I this yeah. is my blazer for the Canadian club today. Okay, I'm going to take it a, a little deeper in because, you know, it's it's fun. I, I always love, you always do such a great job when you're on the National or CTV or whatever, and you always get the hard questions, and I always get the softball questions. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm coming in with one of those. So, oh, so Tokyo is my going to give me a tenth. softball. <laughs> oh, I, I did softball already today. Oh, yes. okay, okay. Um, right. But uh, so Tokyo is my 10th Olympic Games. As you say, this, this is your first. Um uh, to be part of the team, not to be a fan. That's awesome that you're a fan. Anyways, the thing I find funny is uh, the residents of every uh, host city um, before every games, there's always like people complain. No matter where in the world the games have been, including in Vancouver, um, people were really negative about the games coming to Canada in 2010. And I was like, this is this is awesome because in 2019 in Tokyo, the, the Japanese... Um, fan base that like the Japanese public were overwhelmingly positive like it was like incredible like nobody was complaining about the games coming but that's not the case now right so there's a lot of uh, reports about of Tokyo about the residents not being particularly happy how do you respond to that hopefully uh, for starters with a great deal of empathy um, that um, you know the, the Olympics for all its incredible strength and power and grace and what's so magnetic about it is uh, the single greatest, you know, congregation of people at one time around the world, right? So we'll bring 11,000 athletes from 206 countries to Tokyo in the midst of a pandemic. And so when I read reports, um, surveys, uh, polls, that there are there's real nervousness among Japanese people that this is going to occur. I, I sort of say to I'm not surprised. Um, that's that's kind of my starting point. Um, and and I look at the statistics, uh, and and it, it kind of confirms why that should be the case. You know, we're talking about a country that's what triple quadruple Canada's size, that has something in the neighborhood of half the COVID infections of Canada. At last count, something over 500, 570,000 COVID infections and 10,000 deaths. We're double that, right? We're at the 1.3 million mark of infections and over 20,000 deaths. So they have you know, nationals, states of emergency. They're doing their very best to try to minimize infection, and they seem to be doing an okay job. And now here come the Olympic Games. And so I think that's why we've, you know, worked so hard ourselves and worked so hard in conjunction with the IOC to take it so seriously around the countermeasures, the protocols, the testing, the tracing, the isolating, and made a commitment that these games will be like no other set of games um, that have ever taken place before. Um, so everyone should wash from their mind the you know what they think of as the opening ceremony they sh or what they think the closing would look like or even what the competition will look like there won't be overseas spectators there won't be friends and family we won't have a canada olympic house in tokyo it's sad but it's because we're doing our best to preserve the olympic competition but also protect the people involved and the people involved include the people of tokyo um and uh yeah so uh that doesn't you know, that doesn't guarantee that uh, complete safety, but we're doing our absolute best to prioritize the health of everybody involved. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I talk to the athletes about is there's always been a difference between Olympic competition and the Olympic Games. And the athletes, uh, you know, are very focused on the Olympic competition. And they, I think they're feeling pretty lucky that they, they get to go to an Olympic competition, but the Olympic Games are going to be really different. I think you're, it's spot on when you tell people to like, forget that notion but you know i mentioned a little while ago the the tokyo 2020 playbook so maybe we can dive into a little bit and you you can start us off but how is the, how are the pandemic affecting the games like you know the, we could we could go on for the whole hour on this one but it's sort of you know from your perspective what are the high level points on what the pandemic are doing to change the game so when we say they're going to be different let's let's tell everyone here how they're going to be different well um 
yeah, I, I, I sort of just sort of grazed it a little bit in, in what I said in my prior answer. But uh, I think the major difference for competitors, uh, you know, will begin 14 days before they travel to Japan, where they've got to start monitoring their medical conditions and taking two COVID tests. And then they're going to get on a plane and they're going to arrive and they're going to get tested every single day they're there. And they're going to be uh, contained in the athlete's village. And, you know, the, the idea at the Olympic Games is going to be much like, you know, for people familiar with what we did in, in Toronto and Edmonton for the NHL bubbles last summer or the NBA bubble in Orlando. Um, they're they're going to be called nodes because the athlete village and the competition venues themselves aren't going to be one and the same. So athletes will have to travel from one to the other. But the idea is that people who are completely tested and and free of COVID or negative of, uh, from of COVID will all be kept together. Athletes all together and everybody else isolated from them. And they'll and they'll and they'll live and compete in a very isolated existence for the duration. There will be no athlete tourism, you know, afterward, which is, you know, again, an unfortunate casualty. Normally an athlete, as I understand it, would at the end of her or his competition, stick around and cheer on uh, fellow competitors from their country or others. Um, and uh, no, we're going to send everybody home within 48 hours for their safety and the safety of the rest of the team. Um, so it's things like that that uh, will just give it a very different complexion. It'll, I guess, it'll have a bit more feeling of you know it's all business while we're here, and we're going to then try to celebrate it uh, more at home through the use of media. And I guess if there were ever an opportunity, a time where we could do that effectively, it would be in 2021. Yeah, I, I think that that athlete tourism sometimes actually even occurs during the games, right? We use it a bit as as distraction management during the games. So athletes won't be able to go out into the host city and, and sort of, like I said earlier, I'm going to be there for a month and not going out for sushi. I'm not going to get to leave the nodes. So I'm really hoping that the cafeteria has excellent sushi going on. Um, and I, I see I'm, I'm trying to follow with the questions that are coming through in the chat, but it sort of pertains here. What about uh, vaccinations? It's, everyone's asking right now, but what's the... Uh, the current status of vaccinations in our team? Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, our athletes, uh, boy, the, the responsibility and the civic mindedness of our athletes has impressed me. And so from the moment vaccines sort of were a glimmer in someone's eye, our athletes were the first to say, we need to wait our place in the queue here in Canada, that the most vulnerable those who work on the front lines need to be prioritized in Canada. And so, you know, I guess I, I ended up being the person who repeated that uh, publicly in a, in a number of different environments. And I'm proud to say we've, we've made do on that commitment. Um, I think it's fair to say now we're at the point in Canada where there's sort of no discernible cue. And we finally feel like there's a bit of a breakthrough, right, where there seem to be a lot of vaccines, where the age limits are coming down across provinces and people who want vaccines are getting vaccines. That's coincided with a very generous donation that was just announced at the end of the week, last week, uh, from Pfizer, who basically donated two doses for every single person, not just athlete, but athlete, coach, mission team member, uh, referees, you know, anybody who's going to be heading to Tokyo from every country in the world where the Pfizer vaccine is approved. And Canada is one of them. So what that means is we'll end up getting vaccines for our team. And yet it won't come at the expense of somebody in Canada who needs a vaccine. Um, and it won't be through our healthcare system. It'll likely be through uh, our own Canadian sports institutes. And so I, I feel like um, we've sort of benefited from doing our civic duty. And at the same time, we're going to get this very helpful tool that will help protect us, the people of Japan, and ultimately our communities when we come back to, to Canada. Yeah. Um, that's... <laughs> yeah. Assuming they work. <laughs> Every now and then it happens that I get speechless and I'm like, oh, yes, please, 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 all of that. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. more than a hope and a prayer as much as I'm, I'm joking, like fingers crossed. It, it is a very robust plan. And, and you know, it's 
there there's so so many elements of it um but so i i remember sort of march 22nd last year being on a call it was this whole zoom thing was very new to us at the time but it was like a zoom call uh with the senior leadership like yourself from the canadian olympic committee our athletes commission and we made a decision about what the olympic team needed to do the athletes what they needed to do but what have you been doing with the business? Like you're, you're, it's, you know, you're not just the, um, you know, as I said, the prime minister of an Olympic team, you're the CEO and, and um, of the Canadian Olympic committee, a business. So what has the business had to do to respond in this pandemic? Yeah, it's a, I'm glad you ask because um, not only are we a business, I think it surprises just about everybody that I speak with, but my version of chef de mission is explaining how the Canadian Olympic Committee is funded, or to be to be more specific, disabusing people of how they think the Canadian Olympic Committee is funded. We're almost entirely privately funded through 27 marketing partnerships in Canada, um, and you know our four most prominent. We call them our premier national partners, but you know Canadian Tire, Bell, RBC, and the Hudson's Bay Company, and they write incredibly generous checks to the Canadian Olympic Committee as an investment in the Canadian Olympic team and in athletes across this country. So it's not like um, an investment in a pro sport, let's say, where maybe that goes to the shareholders of a corporation or to a big wig owner. This goes into the Canadian sports system. And so, you know, right from the get-go in, in terms of the pandemic, it has been our goal to you know, make sure that we can we, we're in a position to secure their commitment, because if we couldn't secure their commitment, then there that would you know Canadian sport would take a, a hit. And I'm delighted to say that not only have we been able to secure commitments, we've been able to sign on new partners during this period, um, and and get all kinds of new investments from our partners um, during this period as well. Um, so it's been a really challenging period, and yet the business has continued to thrive. And I think that's out of recognition that sport plays a very meaningful role in the lives and in the culture of this country. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that just last week, Sobeys, uh, one of our national partners, uh, announced a million-dollar commitment to feed athletes across the country, literally hand them cards you know that they load up with cash and they can walk into Sobeys banner empire bannered stores around the country and buy themselves groceries and no strings attached and it wasn't even part of our our partnership and um, it's just I'm gonna, incredible I, i'm work. gonna jump yeah. jump in on that like food i used to eat six to eight thousand calories a day when i was a rower like a grocery card <laughs> goes a long way for an athlete right so uh, yeah, yeah i mean it, and and look and it's a good it's a good pivot here because the the challenges athletes have been facing during this pandemic have run so much deeper than how do they feed themselves right i mean i've i think many people have seen on the news you know images video images of, of swimmers let's say brent hayden and kylie moss tethered in a backyard pool um, to make do for the fact that pools are closed and and while their competitors around the world are in you know, world-class Olympic-sized pools training. We've been out of the water 120 days during this pandemic. So maybe over to you, Marnie. Like, you talk to all the athletes as much as anyone. Talk to talk to everyone about the challenges Canadian athletes have faced in it in the lead up to Tokyo, and how what have they been in the ingenious ways that they've been using right. to overcome some of those challenges. Yeah, I think um, I've added a new word to the Olympic logo, you know, the, the Citius Altius Fortius. I've added Adaptius, which um, apparently is wrong. I've been told it's not a real Latin word, but I like it. And it sounds very kind of Harry Potter magical kind of thing. It's supposed to be a comedatio, by the way. Um, but Adaptius works for me and for the point. Um, because the athletes have had to do that. Adaptation is the root of resilience. And I think it is... There's an element that our community in sport, they deal with that somewhat naturally. It's becoming the best in the world has never been an easy thing. And it's how do you figure out how to close the gap between where I am now and where I want to be in the future? And 
I, I would have done this in person, but shit always gets in the way, right? So there's always something, whether it's, you know, you know, your time and injury, a competitor, you know, something always gets in the way and sport has always been about figuring it out. And I think one of the, the amazing groups we've had, like the athletes have been so amazing for adapting and changing, but our coaches and our team leaders and our managers for having to figure stuff out. Like it has been so challenging to manage. Like first we're like, stay at home, stay at home, do your workout in your living room. I was, I had a hurdler who was trying to figure out how to work out in a basement in Edmonton. And I'm just like, I can't help you with that one other than, you know, let's talk through your, your mental health. That's been a big thing for us, right? We've really put a lot of our resources to um, respecting and, and being present for our athletes when, when they've been depressed through this, when they've been angry through this. Um, but then they've gone and they've figured it out. Like, how do I get better today? And they, they approach it in a, the step-by-step kind of format where they figure out just today I need to do a workout and tomorrow I need to do a workout. Now, tomorrow, the next day, I need to do a workout with a mask on and I need to do a workout in a building. Nope, can't do a workout in a building. So how do I do my workout outside? You know, we have uh, athletes who are working with their communities to build like Damian Warner in, in London, working with uh, Western to figure out how to use some of the spaces that nobody else can use and turn it into a training ground for a decathlete. Like the, the ingenuity and the creativity of um, our athletes has been amazing, but at the same time, it kind of shouldn't surprise us, but it does, but it's, it's, it's been really kind of heartwarming for that. But then we come to the point where over half of our team has qualified for the Olympics, right? So we have, you know, we've already said that we're going to have around 400 athletes um, competing in Tokyo and over 400 of them have earned their qualifying spots. But right now, the, the hardest part is athletes aren't getting competitions. Like you're saying, we've been out of our pools for so long. They're not getting competitions. So there's a lot of athletes competing against the clock, uh, against like a weight measurement or whatever they're having to do. And that really messes with your mind as an athlete. Like, what do you want to do? And, and what we want to do, what everybody wants to do for predictions is, you know, when you open up the newspaper, if you're a sports fan, you look at the stats. How are things going for my team? That gives me a sense of how they're going to do. Are they going to make the playoffs? Are they going to win the playoffs? And we start tracking that through the season. And for an athlete, that really helps with the stress monsters. When you, you know that your training is going well, but our athletes aren't getting competitive environments and it remains extraordinarily challenging. And the, the Canadian Olympic committee is doing so much in, in, in front and behind the scenes um, to, to help all our athletes um, manage this. Like we, we have athletes for competitions, um, whether it's going to be our gymnastics team, not being able to go to Rio, you know, we have athletes who haven't been able to go to Argentina for last chance qualifying regattas. But at the same time, right now, we have rowers over in, in uh, Lucerne, Switzerland. Like, there's Olympic things happening every day, and there's Olympic things not happening every day. And so it's been really challenging. Um, but the athletes, if I take it back with all these challenges, like that's, that's what Olympism is, right? Like that's that whole idea why people go, oh, that's, you know, they, uh, that's a Herculean task, or that's a like an Olympic sized task. It's, it's, it's always been hard. And it's never been a straight line. Um, and, and I think, you know, like we said, it's, it, you said there's 71 days or 72 days to the Olympics. 71. I think more importantly, yep. um, it's 71 and 16 hours, so probably 14 hours now, if we're going to be accurate. But uh, it's like 87 days to the closing ceremony. And, and I think that's the thing that, um, we really focus on is, is every day trying to figure out how to how just close that gap, figure out today, you know, that whole, whole idea of just embrace the change, um, you know, see the change, embrace the change and thrive and, and use it to a competitive advantage. But that's is, is there, is there an analogy in here to an athlete that suffers a, a, a difficult injury on on the journey to an Olympic Games and and has that setback or some series of setbacks and that they can in because most athletes I assume have experienced an injury along the way and they and they know how to deal with that it does can they draw from that or is this a completely different and new territory well, I think everyone does draw from that you know um 
but it doesn't help your mind at all, right? Like knowing that, uh, you know, we've had so many situations, um, you know, if I, th I think back over the last 30 years of Canadian sport where athletes have, have had major injuries and they've been out for months and they come back and the thing that you always get to train is your mind, right? And, and we've had a lot of athletes who, who've gone into these creative training spaces where um, what they have available to them is mental imagery and their training and their technique and they're able to work things out. And, and the, the good thing is there is that mental imagery is always um, excellent technique, right? So you, you don't tend to do your men mental imagery on, on negative technique. And so by the time you get, get through it and you get to compete, one of the things we're seeing is more, at, we've had an incredible number of athletes who are posting personal best performances. And I kind of think from, from your question, it made me think in, uh, it's a long time ago now, but at the, the 2006 Winter Olympics, uh, uh, Mary France, uh, Patrice and Mary France, our, 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 we had a, a dance um, figure skating team and she had, uh, he, he let go. They were kind of doing a spin thing and he let go and she fell and her hip was really um, badly injured and they had the world championships were coming up that year in um, Vancouver and she knew she wasn't going to be able to skate for six I'm like, they went on to win the world championships that year even without her skating for two months because it's ingrained. And that's the reason we train so much is so, so that we can step up to it. That doesn't make it easy to do. And I think we have athletes who like in rowing, um, you know, or, or anybody who's going against the clock, the clock is the same clock around the world and it's your same opponent around the world and, and conditions change, but you, you can have a sense of how you're doing, but we have, um, you know, some of our competitors like Erica, we, um, our wrestler, our Olympic gold medalist wrestler who, who needs an opponent and for her to get sharp and to know what she's doing, um, you know, that's, that there's opportunities missing there. So right now we come into it, uh, realistic and we, our goals and, and have, have not, we have not lowered our, our, um, our hopes for our team, right? We always hope the best for them. Um, but we are also allowing themselves to be realistic in, in how they're going to perform. Um, and you know, our bar is still, uh, whatever bar they want. If they, if they want to win, we'll believe that they're going to win and we'll support them. They're going to win. We have, um, we're also going to be embracing the fact that the, the training and our ability to prepare for these games is extraordinarily different. Marnie, you're the, the poster of stability and poise, and you're the inspiration for our, our team. Um, how, how do you keep yourself grounded and inspired? And, and, you know, I'll note 2021 has obviously not been an easy year for you with the passing away of your close friend and teammate, Kathleen Heddle. And so uh, i just love for you to sort of share if you're willing to go there, you know, how hard a year it's been for you and how you've been able to sort of deal with that and overcome. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to bring my Kleenex with me today. Thank you for that. Um, but no, so in, in January of this year, Kathleen uh, passed away after battling four different cancers and, and it was just a huge loss um, for all of us. Uh, but so Kathleen, um, you know, one of the things I took from that relationship working with Kathleen is she's an introvert and, you know, clearly I'm not. And um, I, I made a lot of mistakes for a long time trying to figure out how to make an introvert competitive and aggressive like me. Because I thought the only way you could be competitive and aggressive was to be loud and gregarious and like, like kind of in your face. And then I clued into the fact that Kathleen just kept beating me all the time, which meant she clearly was more competitive and more aggressive than I was. She was just being quiet about it. And I think when I, when I, as I am a chef, I am a chef, not to the extroverts on the team, but we need to uh, definitely recognize the, the tremendous number of extremely talented introverts on the team. And Kathleen helped me realize a lot of the things that are important. And I guess that's, that's how I go th through everything. Like I, I think I have, um, you know, I learned a lot in sport about how to be a good rowing partner. But from Kathleen, I think I, I sort of channel with me and, and um, maybe she became my, my the terrible Star Wars reference here. She became my, my Obi-Wan. So she's in my head all the time, kind of remembering me to, reminding me to use the force for good kind of thing. 
And so uh, when when I'm bringing the team f- forward here, like Kathleen would always remind me to stay focused on the important things. So how do I stay motivated? As is, I remember, like what is truly important to me, and and what is the goal today, and and who who is the focus? Like you know, super random. Like I I. I think Scott Russell told me he was going to be part here and he made fun of a a picture that I posted yesterday and I was talking to the table tennis team and, you know, three of them looked great and I had terrible hair in the photo, but you know, it it was, it was about the table tennis players. So I I chose that. So it's, it's kind of like, what would Kathleen Heddle do? Kathleen would Heddle would always focus on the important things. And then one of the, the, you know, when I came through as a chef, I had these ideas of, of what I wanted my theme to be of all my messaging to like drive people forward and I believe in a philosophy of more, um, you know, it's, it's a personal philosophy and, and I, I actually have a logo for it. Like, a, a no, it's not like a logo, but it's a logo. It's infinity plus one. And I believe in the Olympic environment, we kind of think of all these superheroes, like people who are able to do incredible things. And I've never thought of myself as, as a superhero, but infinity plus one is redundant, right? Cause if you understand infinity, it includes all the possible plus ones out there. And the idea of more, the more that I, I think we need to focus on is, is just the little things, right? Just stop worrying about the big things and, and focus on, on the little things, on the plus ones. And if you focus on all the plus ones, they become infinity. So that is how, as a normal person, I've been able to do, like, you know, you know when Pam introduced me, I'm like the only, Kathleen and I are the only Canadians to have three gold medals from the, the Summer Olympics. How did I do that? I'm just like this normal kid from Etobicoke kind of thing. Um, and I did it by focusing on the plus ones. And so that's how I stay focused is like Kathleen would always remind me to stay grounded, stay grounded on the things that are important and the people I care about and the, and the people who care about me. Um, and, and in those little things, that's, that's how we move forward. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's, uh, it's very important for me to hear it. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we've, we've had a challenging year with our team and, you know, we found that, you know, very important for us is to be as focused as we are on delivering our team to games is to be very focused on how people are doing. And I've, I have found myself asking people questions that I never would have dreamt of asking, you know, just a couple of years ago, just about how people are doing, how they're feeling, getting people to talk about stuff that had not, has nothing to do about business and doing it over a computer, over Zoom platforms and Teams platforms and what, what would have not long ago felt, you know, unthinkable and quite impersonal. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my first games as CEO of the Canadian Olympic Committee. Any advice for me? Any tricks or tips? Um, oh my gosh, uh, there's so many. Um, but I, I guess during the games for us on the mission side, for the support side, it's energy management, right? So it's it's going to be you know, it's 16 days of glory, but for us, it's it's going to be 26 days getting everyone in and out. And the actual games, it's it's about um, ener- energy management, but it's, it's really about enjoying it. Like it's sometimes as much as we're going to get into, into the weeds on, um, the details and, and, um, all the business of every day. It's going to be like just this crazy hamster wheel of spinning every now and then jump off the hamster wheel and look out and, and, and figure out it's going to be different. Um, but in, enjoy it, in, enjoy the moments. Um, you know, I remember talking to one athlete, and I was saying, well, when you get to the Olympics, you you can't pretend you're not at the Olympics. You you have to come out. And I, I was I was saying it was kind of like a, a gopher or a groundhog. You got to come out or you know look around and go, oh my god, this is amazing, and, and let yourself be that that kid who is a, a sports fan and just loving it and eating it up, and you know that kind of like I kind of want to get that autograph from that person over there or a, a picture with that person over there. Like let yourself have those moments because they're really special and it's a special environment. And then, you know, get to the other part that you love, which is being really good at your job and, and uh, a really good supporter. And, and, you know, one of the things I've always said about my role is I can never, ever take any credit for anybody's performance, but I'm so proud of being part of their preparation. And, and so, you know, we, if we dig in and we're excellent at the, the, our side of the preparation and we enjoy the ride, um, it's going to be pretty amazing. 
Um, David, we're, we're coming into like, we've been here like 50 minutes already. We're supposed oh. to wrap up in seven. I know okay. it's like, there's so much we, I'm like, I want to give you like quick hits here. I'm like, I have a couple of uh, questions that I had going in. Um, I'm going to come in with, I'm going to, I'm going to intentionally ask you to answer this briefly. And, and I would like the audience to accept that he's going to give a brief answer. Um, but maybe people are curious about it. Uh, just, and, and then I'm going to bring it back again. I'm just going to go through the brief one mm-hmm. anyways. Um, you know, th- there doesn't seem to be any easy buttons for you. You you've taken this, this job with the Canadian Olympic committee and your first games, well, your first games, you went to Lima and in Peru, there was challenges there. It was, we won't get into that. And then, you know, here we have a pandemic and the next games are coming up in uh, 10 months. They're the Winter Olympics in China. And a lot of people have have concerns. And this actually goes into another question, actually. So this works out nicely for me. Two questions in one. A lot of people have um, concerns about the way the Uyghur minority have been treated. Um, you know, I'm just going to say it, the genocide that's been been going on there. And so I'm going to ask you to answer that like take take the two olympics and figure out how do the games stay true to the olympic ideal and current in in light of these situations okay i'll i'll try to be brief but i have to share uh, an an anecdote about lima before i do answer the question about staying true to the ideals Um, and that's we had a wonderful experience at the pan am games in peru but i think every single person that went didn't see the sunlight for two weeks and um so, as in the weather was terrible well yeah it was we also made the i think the silly mistake of thinking it would be warmer than it was so our mittens came canadian mittens came in quite handy uh for the the pan am games that were in the middle of our summer but so but i i, I went around a town in a in a, in a toyota with a, a my attache as they're called another french word that we get to uh, throw around and my attache was telling me about how Lima is known as the great city. And, you know, I thought that was nice of him to, you know, as tour guide to, you know, tell me all the nice things and he'd show me around and all that. And he kept referring to the great city and how am I liking it? And, and I was polite, but I was, I remember whispering and I don't know if you were in the back of the car with me, Marty, at one time when I was like, I don't know why he keeps calling it this great city. And then he, I think he overheard me. He said, not the great city, the gray city. <laughs> And uh, then I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. It makes perfect sense for me. Um, yeah, but on to your, your question, and I'll unpack it as, uh, as best I can. Yeah, there, there's no, sorry, after I try to be brief. Um, there, the, the challenges in Tokyo are not just COVID. They relate to social justice issues and this thing called Rule 50 and whether athletes are going to be able to properly express themselves in and around the Olympic environment in Tokyo. And the challenges uh, related to the Beijing Winter Games are, are uh, multiple, um, but they, they relate to you know, the fact that two Canadians are in prison in, in China, um, in effect being held hostage. They relate to the, uh, the treatment of Muslim Uyghurs in Western China and the human rights issues around that. And then there are many more. And, um, what I will say is we're, we're doing our level best to not rely on others. And we're drawing from our experience in Sochi, where I think we had a really difficult time sort of saying, how do we go to a country in Russia? Into, this was back in 2014. How do we go to this country that has just passed a series of laws that are quite um, unfair to LGBTQ plus in that community and feel like we're staying true to what we as Canadians and Team Canada stand for? And what it led to was a series of commitments and investments and programs that I think make us now the the most, among the most, if not the most diverse and inclusive team in the world. And we're going to do the same thing as it relates to social justice, doing the same thing as it relates to social justice causes in Canada. And we're going to do the same thing as it relates to what is going on in China as well. We think that it's about how we participate, not whether we participate. Um, and that, frankly, when faced with a choice between participation and not participating, engagement versus disengagement, we must engage. Um, that being part of this conversation. Um, every time I talk about the possibility of a boycott of China, I think that's a positive conversation that we're shining a light on human rights in China, as an example. 
And therefore that's the power of the Olympics. And we need to tap into that. That's not that brief. I, but. No, but I, I think one of the other things, um, you know, the pandemic has, has brought and it has allowed us is that our athletes, instead of being all over the world, have been home in their communities. And, and not particularly to the, that Uyghur issue, but to whether it's been um, Black Lives Matter or the Me Too moments and stuff like, uh, stuff like that. It that's, sounds so dismissive. I don't, I don't mean to, but, you know, we, we have had athletes who have, um, you know, organized Black Lives ra uh, Matter rallies. We have athletes who have gotten their, like, master's degrees, who've been valedictorians of their class, who have gone and, and, and um, volunteered in their communities. Um, so that I think there is um, an issue, like, when we talk about the Olympic ideal, it's not just on the field of play, right? It's, it's how we take it to the communities. And then I, I know that, um, you know, athletes like myself, we go into schools all the time and we talk about, you know, the different people that we meet and, and we get to go um, from an environment where we've been in an Olympic village where 205 nations gather and, and are competitors and fiercely want to win, but at the same time come home. And, and, and I think how we bring those messages home um, is really the point of it all, right? Like I, I have always had a tough time saying you should invest in, you know, my sport and my ability to do be follow my dreams. Um, but I do think, and I am very proud that Canadians uh, choose to include us uh, as as part of the process of being ambassadors of of what a good Canadian is, um, and 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 how we share around the world. I agree, and 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 so that's where. We're, we're developing this, this muscle memory and this real bias towards action in areas of things we control. So, you know, we, we immediately have created, you know, Oli grants with real focus on BIPOC causes. We, you know, in the, in the aftermath of George Floyd, we said, why do we have an unpaid internship program that tends to be hugely biased in favor of people with of privilege? We scrap that and in comes a new paid internship program with dedicated internships for BIPOC candidates. Um, and there's a long list of things we've done that, you know, that aren't just, you know, we've signed up for the, you know, Black North Initiative, but then we're following through on these things. And, and I, I see Pam's now joining us, but, you know, the thing that, that I have a long-term vision for, it, and this is where you're going to see the Canadian Olympic Committee, which has always been focused on putting athletes on podiums, we're going to develop a little bit more focus on athletes at the other end of the sport continuum. Can we make sure that every single Canadian, no matter your walk of life, has access to sport? Because we think Team Canada needs to reflect Canada. And so uh, that's where we're going to invest some real energy. And people are like, that's not what the Olympic Committee does. And, you know, that's yesterday's Olympic Committee. Tomorrow's Olympic Committee is going to do that. So that by 2040, let's say, you know, the Olympic team that goes to Tokyo 2040 looks exactly like Canada. And that's our real commitment we're making. All right. I'm going to pass it back to you in one second, Pam. I'm going to like quickly answer uh, one question here. It was like, what was the, when did I know I wanted to go? Uh, what was the moment I knew I wanted to be an Olympian? And the truth is it was the closing ceremony party at the 1984 Olympics and they had this like spaceman come down on a jetpack thing, and he was uh, representing the the Seoul Olympics. And he, he's like, "I welcome the children of the world or the athletes of the world to gather four years today." And then the athletes had this huge party in LA on on the in the LA Coliseum, and Lionel Richie was playing the song all night long, and it looked like an amazing party. I hadn't even learned to row yet, but I wanted to be an Olympian right then. So that was my I wanted to go to the Olympic moments. Last question, quick fire. Let's let's assume we get to go to the sports. What sport do you want to see in Tokyo? What's what's your like? I can't wait to go um, to that one. This is this to you or to me? <laughs> I'm I'm asking you, and I'm, clearly you're going to ask me back. But you know, I'm asking you. This is, this is so unfair, and it puts totally and all that. I haven't even thought it through. Okay, um, triathlon um, in my recent years I've become uh, an aspiring age group triathlete and I want to see Tyler Mislachuk kick the crap out of the competition awesome Marty? Uh, 
Yeah, thanks, ma'am. Um, I, you know what? There's so many. There's so many athletes that I know personally, so I want to go and share in their moment. But I think I want to see sport climbing. It's one of our new sports. And Sean and Yolanda, they are they climb up a wall faster than I could run a class around along the floor. And what they do is just incredible. And, and they were actually featured last night on the news. Um, but, uh, I did, had a conversation with them recently and, um, just, I, I, I'm just inspired to see what they're actually doing live. That'll be amazing. Marnie, you you should say they climb up a wall faster than you could fall down. it. That's true too. I'm a rower. I, I, I like, I sit on my butt and go backwards. Like what they do is what all the other athletes do is amazing. And I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to let Dave uh, uh, wrap us up, but I'm just going to say, I am so proud and so excited um, to be chef de mission, but um, I have always been a very proud Canadian. And I just think we have the best country. I have been coast to coast to coast uh, geographically. Uh, our, our country is gorgeous. Our people are amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, the chef de mission of, of this team. Well, that's a beautiful tribute to Canada. And so I'll pay uh, my tribute to the Canadian club of Toronto and, uh, and my appreciation on behalf of, of both Marnie and I for, for having us here, uh, for uh, listening to uh, our answers to our questions, uh, our antics. Uh, we've become fast friends in this, in this period of time, and, but it's been a real pleasure and privilege to, to work with Marnie and to you know, get to this point 71 days from Tokyo. Uh, wish us luck. Marnie, David, thank you so much. I absolutely hate interrupting this because it's been fantastic and I've loved every minute of it. Um, David, you said how emotional it was to get your kit for the first time after being such a fan for years. This is emotional for all of us. Like every one of us has our own memories, our own connections with the games. And, you know, we can, I'm sure all relate to it. Marnie, you had me in tears. So beautiful tribute to Kathleen. And I will really embrace that plus one thought. Uh, maybe share it with my kids today too. Uh, it was a beautiful thought. Um, the Olympic Games undoubtedly connects all of us across the country. And we're so proud of Team Canada. We realize this has been different. We admire the creative resiliency and adaptive yesness of, was that it, Marnie? Adaptive yesness of uh, <laughs> the athlete. And, and David, I know you said it was going to be, unfortunately, kind of an all business experience in Tokyo, but just I, I do hope Team Canada knows that and feels the respect and support of all Canadians as we cheer them on as they go for gold in Tokyo. Um, we'll, we'll be with you in spirit for sure. Guests, thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us today. We hope that you'll um, also be able to join us for some of the upcoming events. Real quickly, I'll touch on them. Wednesday, May 19th, we're hosting the chair and CEO of the Ontario Securities Commission, Grant Bingo. He'll be discussing trends affecting the market and the challenges of balancing a shifting regulatory focus and a growing mandate. Join us for that discussion. And on Thursday, May 20th, we're hosting Ian Scott, chairperson and CEO of the CRTC, to discuss how internet services have become even more vital during the pandemic and how the CRTC is working to improve access for Canadians living in rural and remote communities and their efforts to promote such choices and more affordable wireless services. And thank you, of course, again, to Morneau Chappelle for sponsoring today's events. Our events would not be possible without our sponsors. So thank you for your continued generosity. And thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenberg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Yes, thank you again for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, David.